Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. The first story. Boss yelled at me that I was a bad employee and I could quit. I did this and the whole team quit. The second story. Dealer told me to go to court, so I did, but he was fired. The third story. The head of IT was unhappy with me constantly being late, so I stopped doing extra work. And the first story is, you don't like it here, there's the door. This is my own personal story that took place in Belgium, circa 2015 to 2016. Context, in my mid-twenties I worked in accounting with four other mid-twenties guys. We were a solid well-oiled machine that ran flawlessly and yet we had way too much work and we needed an extra person. We had taken over in one year from the previous team who seemingly quit for no reason. At the end of the second quarter, we crushed through the mountain of work with a collective four weeks of OT between us. Boss was happy and allowed us to finally go on vacation. More like he knew we had accumulated too many recovery days and gave us the bonus we were promised if we reached the goal. We've been unhappy with the situation for some time and have been being about it. Clearly there's enough work to justify hiring an extra person, so we go tell the boss. As soon as we explain why we're asking for an extra person, he goes ballistic. How dare we? Employees who are terrible at our jobs dare asks for an extra hand when all we do is F around for the entire day and we're costing him money. In his screaming, he points to the door and says, I'm not holding you hostage. If you're unhappy, I suggest you walk out. We're stunned. What the F did he just say? We came in to ask for help and he's telling us to F off? We ask him to explain what he means. He literally says, I don't need you. I don't need any of you. Quit if you don't like it. I wish I could say we did, but we were stunned because we thought since we've crushed our workload, we would be in his good graces. So we shut the F up and let him continue his tirade. Come January, crunch time is coming. Boss gathers the entire company in a meeting room and goes on to explain how we're horrible workers and can't do anything properly and we're costing him money. He then goes on to say the company made a thousand percent profit compared to last year. If we're so bad at our jobs, how come we multiplied profits? He goes on to say that from now on no more bonuses because we're SH workers and we're expected to stay in the office until our work's done, no matter how long that may be. No exceptions. Whoever doesn't comply will get fired. He reminds us he can replace us at any moment and that we need to prove we deserve our jobs. The thing is, I knew I was the best employee there. Not just the best accountant, but the most innovative, most charismatic, most resourceful, and on top of that, the rest of the team and a lot of people from the other departments kinda relied on my upbeat, seemingly lighthearted, jokerish attitude. And so, tired of his SH and extremely scared of the mountain of incoming work, I get up and just say, I quit. Boss doesn't understand what I mean and continues his meeting while I go to clear my desk. I've cleared my desk by the time he's finished the meeting, and while I'm walking out past him, he understands what I'm doing. He immediately starts yelling that I'm abandoning my post and that it's unprofessional and there will be consequences. I'm calm because I had already made up my mind. We're in front of everyone, including the rest of my team. I simply tell him, boss, we all heard you say that I'm free to leave at any point because you don't need me. Isn't that right, guys? No one answers, of course, because they're all, boss included, stunned that the nice guy who's always polite and keeps his head down is being assertive. Before boss gets a chance to snap out of it, I tell him that he mistook my tact and diplomacy for acceptance and that I'm only doing what he said. Maybe he should choose his words carefully next time. The rest of the team quit within three months. They knew where SH was going and they spent their time at work looking for work anyway. The other teams quit within 12 months and he was bought out within 16 months because most clients had stopped paying and sued him since he had no one to do the actual work. All because he thought I wouldn't comply with his own malicious request. When it happened I had no idea if he was real or not but I was so revolted by his audacity to deny bonuses when there was so much supposed profit that I just thought, F this SH, I'm out. But yeah, it turns out he did lie about the 1000% and only made some 400%. He genuinely thought he offered the best working conditions and genuinely thought we should work as hard as he did. He was in the office at 7 hours 30 and left at 8 or 9 in the evening and he genuinely thought he was going to be number one in the market. The second story is, Dealership said Sue, so I did. This all started December of last year and just finished last week. So bought a car from one of those buy here and pay here places. I love the car. It's a Mazda 5 from 2014. Basically the smallest minivan I've ever seen. Well on Christmas we drove to some family for dinner and celebration. When we went to leave the car it would not start. We checked everything and found out the horn wasn't even connected. Any fuse that wasn't absolutely needed was simply missing and the tires were the original tires. 
Beyond that, we hooked up to the computer and it read several errors, but the one getting in the way was the immobilizer. I had never known the van had one. I called AAA and set up towing, but because we were in the middle of nowhere, AAA couldn't get a tow truck to us under our membership, free. So we had to call a tow truck and then submit the bill to AAA after the fact. So family let us borrow their car and the van was towed to a shop. A few days later in the shop calls and tells us what's wrong. I live in Texas, a single party consent state, and I record all my calls thanks to an app on my phone. The long list of car issues isn't important. The point of this van is a basic work van. The only issue they found stopping it from running is the immobilizer is active and they can't touch it without talking to the dealer. I three-way call the dealership in the shop and we talk for 17.43 minutes during this call. The dealership acknowledged we were not behind and everything should be working unless it malfunctioned. The dealership also gave permission for the shop to bypass it and we would be reimbursed the towing and repairs. All the shop needed to do to get the van running was bypass the immobilizer and a couple days later we picked up the can and paid the bill. Both bills came to just under $300 and we started calling the dealership. The first few conversations go well and the phone rep seemed interested in helping, but mostly I end up getting tossed around from department to department and then disconnected. That went on for some time and I of course took to Reddit to find out options. As almost always happens, Reddit users know some crazy facts on how to get stuff done. So I followed their advice and kept calling, eventually getting to a supervisor, and the first supervisor said he'd get it taken care of and we ended the call. Two more days go by and nothing is heard. So I call back, get tossed around, and then get another manager who says, we're not responsible for mechanical issues and hangups. I call back now quite annoyed, and eventually get back to the same manager. I explain I have all the information and call recordings, including the repair shop three-way call. He cuts me off and says, what are you going to take us to court over $296.47? I don't think so, but go ahead and sue. We will win, and if that small amount is worth suing to you, you probably don't have the resources to actually sue. This of course made me quite upset, so off to a justice of the peace and explain what's happened. They give us a small claims form and explain the process. We can fill it out and pay for a constable to serve the dealership, or fill out the paper and take it to the dealership unfilled, and explain everything to a manager in person. We chose the cheaper route because the manager on the phone was right. We didn't have the money to have it served, only filed. So we transcribed the phone calls, found out how to fill out the paper. The hardest part was finding the agent, and we didn't know what that meant, but we again turned to Reddit and learned. We gathered the bills and all the paperwork and made our way to the dealership's payment center. I wait in line and see the name of the manager is the same as the manager on the phone that told me to sue. I wait in line, and when it's my turn, I ask to talk to John, and he comes over and sits across from me. After making introductions, and I confirm it's the same guy, I start to explain the situation again. As I'm explaining, I see when he recalls talking to me on the phone. So he starts to dismiss me and I explain that he asked me to sue, and I'm here with all my evidence in the unfixed suit, giving him one final chance. He starts to look over the papers and asked if I still had the recordings. I said yes, I could email him a copy. We sit and talk for about an hour as he reads, then I sat with a slight aggravated tone. If something isn't done today, not only am I going to head right back to the courthouse and file, as well as tack on as much for emotional distress and whatever else the clerk hinted at. The clerk was very open-mouthed with ideas, as well as send a copy of everything to every email on the corporate website. At this, our conversation drew the attention of a woman in a power suit, who rushes over for a recap. I find out she's John's boss's boss's boss, and she's none too happy about how far things have gone. She assured me that all would be made right, and gave me her cell number and email. I gave her the papers and left. The next Monday at 8 a.m. I got a call asking if credit being applied to the account would be acceptable. I say yes and she explains they will credit $500 to the account as payments. The payments are only $155 every two weeks. I agree and we talk for a few minutes when I ask why it took this much just to get things done. It shouldn't have and certain people are no longer employed at the company. Well today was Wednesday and the day of the payment but when I went to make the payment it was already done. Thank you power suit lady. The last story is, you're working 20 minutes more every day? Unacceptable. In the early 2000s, I was living in the commuter belt and working in central London. For those not familiar, London only has one train line running through it from north to south. Okay, pedants, there's the hashtag cross Liz perp line coming, but it's not here yet and this was 2000 something. The rest of the lines terminated somewhere on the circle line of the underground, roughly. For your average commuter, that means your local train will go to between one and four stations, and so you'll favor jobs your side of the city to save getting a bus or tube, but for many it involves one or two of them too. For me, I only had one destination from my local station, which was a tiny, slow trains only one, and it wasn't the station right across the road from my office. 
To get there, I would have to make a change. This added to the journey time just enough that I was five minutes late to work every day. However, I've lied to you. There was one and only one train a day that went to the station I wanted, but it left an hour earlier and got me in an hour and 20 minutes earlier. There was also a single train back in the evening 30 minutes after I clocked off. So my daily routine was to get the train with a change in the morning, arriving five minutes late, and in the evening I'd work 25 minutes extra and get the direct train home. With the station being so close, I was fine to leave it that close to the wire. I usually got a seat even cutting it so fine, so all was good, for about 18 months. For some reason I do not understand, maybe it was my fighting with the guy who kept assigning me work, even though he wasn't my boss. My actual boss relayed that his boss, the head of IT, was unhappy with me constantly being late. I was young, I was naive, I thought they'd understand that I was working when net 20 plus minutes every day. My boss was actually very cool, and didn't want to be dealing with this, but his boss was making a stink, so he explained to his boss, and the reply came back that I must be in on time, because those are your contracted hours. I was young and naive, but that doesn't mean I wasn't a pedantic little SH. I proceeded to get the early train, losing an hour's sleep each morning, and arrive at the office an hour and 20 minutes early, took my shoes off, put them on my desk, set an alarm, and did my best to claw back that lost sleep. As people trickled into the office, I refused to work or even answer a phone until I was within my contracted hours. Come clocking off time, I would pack up and leave to go stand on the platform for nearly 25 minutes, staring off into the distance, thinking about all the work they're losing from me. This lasted about a week before I was told I can't sleep at my desk, so I found the smallest break room that had a sofa and made that my nap spot. It wasn't comfortable, but I was peeved at how strict they were being. Of course, I carried on going home when my contracted hours were up. A few weeks later, my chance came. The SH had hit the fan and they needed me to work late. As I said before, my immediate boss was cool. And I had an I know you know what I'm really saying when I say this conversation with him about how this was outside my contracted hours. But I understand that there's give and take and that when it's needed or doesn't cause an issue. Give and take, right? After that evening, I started showing up five minutes late again and nothing was said about it again. I also started staying right up until my train was due, sometimes. Edit. To say that I didn't get paid overtime unless it was approved beforehand, like the day it hit the fan, I just worked the extra to finish up what I was doing, and because I was young and dumb enough to think hard work got you somewhere. Thanks for watching, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.